praise and glory. Give him praise and glory. Give him praise and glory. Thank you, Jesus. Worship him and bless him. We thank you. Lift your hands, lift your hands and bless him. Thank him for the indwelling of the Spirit. You know, I love to sing that song again. There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own Son. say this to those of you who are pastors and I just saw the spirit of God right before me here the word order order means to put first things first you know Paul when he says let all things be done decently in the order he meant tongues must have interpretation when you are in the service so that there will be prophecy in other words order means be that good steward of the wisdom of God don't put last things first. Put first things first. Uh, we, we need to put a lot of things in order. That you got the Holy Ghost means you have to be responsible. You have to be a faithful steward. Be a person of order. Order, 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 order. Set things in order. I see many of us go back to our churches and ministries and we put it in order. Put first things first. Whatever you have found, you have put last Instead of being first, go put it back in order. You see, sometimes it could be uh, what, what is predominant in your nation or in your city or in your village or in your town, wherever you are, or things you watch on television or things you see on Facebook, you know, and you, you, you put first things first, uh, first things last and last things first. Put it back in order. Put it back in order. Put the things that ought to be first in the first place. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we thank you. We give you praise. Welcome five people around you. Come on, let's have service. Thank you. 
great time. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Sit down. Are you still there? Matthew 16. All right. I know you've opened there already. I will surprise you. Zachariah 4. <laughs> Matthew 16. All right. Verse 13. All right. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philip, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others, some Elijah, sorry, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said unto them, uh, uh, sorry, and, and answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed is thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which in heaven will shed that uh, you know, throughout today. And then he says, I say unto thee, I also say unto thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, uh, listen to that. We, we, we've seen the word rock is his salvation. Okay? The salvation which is a post-redemption or a post-resurrection reality. Then he also mentions my church. And I need to pay attention to the emphasis, the personal emphasis that he plays on in my church. Now, when you say my church, that's my assembly. That means he's the one that will assemble it, which means he will always be found in this assembly. So it is church. So the church of Christ, the ecclesia, I told you what ecclesia is, is from the Hebrew word, call out, that's Moses' assembly of the children of Israel from the Exodus. So from salvation, okay, God assembles Israel in Moses' words, and he brings them together as a nation. And that's exactly what the church is. Now, Jesus said, this is my church. And just like Israel built a tabernacle, as it were, as a type and a figure, for Jehovah, he's saying to us that this assembly has me. It's his assembly. That's why he said, where two or three are gathered, there I am. He's not talking about gathering together, uh, just like a physical assembly. He's saying that this assembly has me in it. This assembly has me. It's my assembly, my ecclesia. So the ecclesia of Christ must have his character. Whoever he is, his ecclesia must carry him. And that's why whatever wasn't in Jesus' sermons must not be found in his ecclesia. The content of your sermons must be the content of the head of the church. Is that clear? That must be the content. And so Christ is therefore in the ecclesia. Is there. And so we need to, again, look at him because if he's different in his resurrection, then he wasn't the one that was raised. For a man to be raised from the dead and qualified to be so, he must be the one who died. He must be the one who died. And in his ecclesia, he is there. So we want to pick out one of the characteristics of the head of this assembly. Because he is the great shepherd of the sheep. Hebrews 13 and 20. The great shepherd of the sheep. First Peter 5 and 5 calls him the chief shepherd. That's what he is. He's is the chief shepherd. What you can call the archbishop. Actually, Jesus actually is the archbishop. Hallelujah. <laughs> He's the archbishop of the sheep. All other pastors, shepherds, are under shepherds. We serve in his capacity. It's his office. Hallelujah. So, what are the characteristics of this Christ? This head of this assembly? What are the characteristics? Now, if you read very well, just read the four Gospels, whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you read the account. If you see the way they summarized 
his ministry without even having to go into the details of quoting each verse. In Acts 2.22, when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, that day of Pentecost, sorry, there are many days of Pentecost, that particular day of Pentecost, he said, you know Jesus Christ, who God, he says God marked him out, he singled him by mighty signs and wonders and miracles. He said, you yourselves know. So it was a characteristic of the Son of God. It was. When Peter was talking about him again in Acts chapter 10, he says, you know, the word that went around Judea and throughout the coasts, how God, verse 38, anointed Jesus of Nazareth, he says, with the Holy Ghost. And then he says, with power, not the Holy Ghost plus power. That's a, that would be very funny. <laughs> his Holy Ghost, he's anointed with the Holy Ghost, then with power, he went about Doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He calls that the message of the four Gospels. For God was with him. So, even if you heard nothing about Jesus, what went round about him in the four Gospels was that he healed the sick. I want to find out why. He healed the sick. He did. He was known prominently to heal the sick. Now listen to what Peter calls it. He calls it a sign. I dare say that many of my charismatic friends don't know what a sign is. The word sign is from the word simeon, a Greek word. I'll tell you what it means. A sign is an indicator of something else. It's like a sign will always point to something else. It's like a lesser expression of the original substance. A sign. And then, a sign will point you to something. That is, the reason for a sign is another subject entirely. So, the sign will carry something that is similar to what it's pointing out. Are you following this now? Good. Now, in the ministry of Jesus, healing was a sign. You should listen very, very carefully now. It was a sign of something. Healing was not his work. It's the same way that Moses was a preacher of the gospel. He was a prophet of God. So the signs would be the signs of what he was saying. That's why the children of Israel were spoken of by the writer of Hebrews. We could just check that. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Is it verse 11 and 12? No. Let me just see it. Hebrews chapter 3. No. Verse 9. Your fathers tempted me Proved me and saw my walks 40 years. Now, how would they see his walks for 40 years and then he says they did not believe? Because you wonder, what's the difference? There's a difference. The reason for the walks is to point you to a message so that you believe. That's why it's called unbelief, unpersuadableness. That is, they, they, could, they, went, they didn't get to the end of what they heard. So, the walks of Moses all had an indication to something. Just like when they crossed the sea. They crossed the sea so that they will know of the baptism into Christ. Everything, the manna, the water, the preservation, everything 
What is called the wilderness experience is what we now call the walk in the spirit. So that you don't fulfill the loss of the flesh. Everything was a sign of a message. Just follow what I'm saying tonight. Now I want to pick up healing. Because tonight is a healing service. Now, why did Jesus heal the sick? Why? Yes, he's good. His goodness is forever. He is good. Healing is good. Everybody knows healing is good. If you're falling sick before, you know healing is good. You used to be sick. So sick. In fact, I had an hospital then that I used to go to. Queen's Hospital, Dubai, Ibadan. Interestingly, I've been saying that story a lot till I discovered that the daughter of the doctor is now a member of our church. So I said, your father was my doctor. You know, and I'll go in there and practically admit myself. He got to the point and I said, oh, you are here. Go upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes in 1992, I was diagnosed of a kidney condition. And I know what I went through. I know how I had to stick to drugs at some particular time. You know, that's when you know faithfulness. <laughs> you will be faithful. You are faithful. Seven o'clock. So healing has to be good. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's got to be good. You don't need a doctrine to tell you healing is good. Fall sick first. You see the goodness of healing. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, so Matthew chapter 8. Let's see Jesus now. Why did he do that? Because there were doctors in his day. Come on. There were doctors in his day. And doctors aren't evil people. So why did he heal the sick? There were doctors in his day. Hallelujah. In fact, he gave a parable of the Samaritan and he mentioned they went to be treated. <laughs> so he's not evil, okay? Now look at Matthew 8. This was the first miracle that Matthew will record. I mean, uh, the first, very first one. The second, so the second one, he had recorded one uh, in, in the same chapter, uh, two, two actually, before this one. Then he talked about Peter's mother and talked about people that came in their numbers. He had mentioned in Matthew 4 and Matthew, yeah, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, how Jesus went around and healed the sick. But he now mentioned particular cases in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, Matthew chapter 8. Now in 16, he says, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirit with his word and healed all that were sick. 17. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Listen carefully now. He's quoting Isaiah 53. He says, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now, Matthew is using a kind of interpretation that you mustn't lose. Now, the term he bore means to carry on yourself. That would be strange. Because Jesus, in his early ministry, did not carry any sickness on his body. So, without much ado, we know verse 17 happened when he died. Come on, let me see your hand now. So, if verse 17 happened when he died, how come he's healing the sick? And then he, he goes to carry what he has already healed. No. Because verse 17 is talking about a spiritual condition. Verse 16 is a physical condition. Nobody, all scholars, agree that verse 17 is in the redemption. And verse 16 is in his earthly ministry. So which means verse 17 will be a spiritual condition. Let me see if you understand what I'm saying. Now, if you, if you read Matthew, because Matthew has a very unique, very unique 
uh, interpretation. He's different from John. John has his own kind of hermeneutic. Uh, I don't want to go into all that now. But look at Matthew. Something Matthew uses when he uses the word fulfilled. In Matthew's Gospel chapter 2, for example. Matthew's Gospel chapter 2. In verse 15, this was when Jesus and uh, Mary and John had to leave. Oh, sorry, Joseph, sorry. And he says, and there was, they were unto the death of Herod, they were in Egypt, to the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. So you can see that verse 14, they are in Egypt. Verse 15, what will happen after? So, the, what happens in 14 led to what happened in 15. Let me see if you understand what I'm saying here. I'll show you another one. The next, look at verse 23. Verse 23. Okay, verse 22. And when he heard that Achilles did reign in Judea in the room of his father Aaron, he was afraid to go there. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside to the parts of Galilee. Okay. And they, he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, he shall be called a Nazarene. So he came to Nazareth so that he will now be called. Is that very clear? So that means an event now leads to, one event points to the other one. Let me see if you understand that, okay? Let's show you one more, just one more. <laughs> Matthew 1. Matthew 1, verse 21. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with a child, and bring forth a son. He shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So, he's saying, he's talking about his birth. Than the events before his birth. So when you hear that it might be fulfilled, that means one event points to the other. Let me see if that's clear. So it is not in the healing ministry of Jesus that he carries sickness and disease. Is that very clear? Very good. So, which means one points to the other. So if the healing ministry of Jesus is called a sign, that means he took physical ailments as an indication that he would take sin and all that is with it. So, which implies that the healing ministry of Jesus was a sign of his redemptive sacrifice. Hallelujah. Does that make sense to you? Because Jesus didn't carry sicknesses on his body in the four Gospels. No, he didn't carry sickness on his body in the four Gospels. He carried sin on himself when he died. He became sin, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us. Romans 4, 25, say he was delivered up for offenses, raised up for justification. 1 Peter 2, 25, say he bore our sins on himself, or his body, soma, on his body on the tree. Hallelujah. Say, by his stripe, you are healed. And what's the healing? You are now returned to the bishop of your souls. So, healing, therefore, is a sign of reconciliation and completeness. That's what it is. So, healing is a sign. Now, do you know the first person? <laughs> Look at Exodus 15, 26. Exodus 15, 26. If thou will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God. You know, at the time Moses said this, there was no law. What they had were the oracles of the fathers. That is the promise of the Messiah. 
So he says, if you hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will do what is right in his sight and give ears to his commandments and keep all his statutes, you'll say, where are they? <laughs> they are the utterances of the fathers, the patriarchs, the gospel in the mouth of the prophets before Moses. And then he says, I will put none of these, things, that's a permissive language, which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, I know this is a very commonly used text for, the, for healing, physical healing, all right, so it's not a problem. But you see, Moses carries something else in him there. He, he had just done a physical miracle. Then he points to a greater one. Moses here. Remember, when he raised that brazen serpent on the pole in Numbers 21, it was for healing. Then he says, if you look, you will be chaya, kept alive. And Jesus said, as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man be lifted up, and whoever believes in him should not perish. But I thought what Moses did was physical healing. It had a message behind it. So healing is a sign of God's saving grace. Healing is not the message, but it's a sign of the message. A sign of his message. A sign of his goodness and graciousness. Watch this now. In Mark 16, Jesus says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. These signs shall follow. Signs of what? Signs of what you have believed. These signs, that's not what you have believed, but it's a sign of what you have believed. Shall follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out demons. Why? Why is that so? Because we also were delivered from the power of darkness. So the casting out of demons that we do is a sign of who we are. He says you will take up serpents. You drink anything that is going to hurt you. These are signs. All right? Of the identification the believer has in Christ. They are not show-offs. No. They are signs of the gospel. So when he says, they will lay hands on the sick. And the sick should recover. They are signs of the gospel that we have believed. That's why in verse 20. So they went forth everywhere and preached the word. And God walking with the message and confirming the message with signs. So that means the message is not the sign, but the sign is for the message. Let me see if you understand that now. All right. So this is why signs and wonders happen. Because do not forget, signs and wonders are never eternal. But they point to an eternal reality. Hallelujah. Are you still out there? Are you still out there? So, in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul mentions the gifts of healings as found in the manifestation of the Spirit. I'll use that loosely tonight. He mentions the gifts of healings. And he says, all these walk at the one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally, verse 11, as he wills. He mentions the same gifts again in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. He said he set some in the church, firstly apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, after that workers of miracles, and he says gifts of healings, helps, and governments, that's your tongues. And he mentions are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. Covet earnestly, verse 31, the best gifts. So he mentions that as the work of the Spirit even today. Hebrews 2, 4. God also bearing them witness both with signs, wonders, diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So healing, watch this quickly, is a predominant miracle. Why? Write this down. This is for your further study. It's the closest sign to salvation. Healing 
is the closest sign. That's why you see that Isaiah used healing almost all the time for salvation. It is the closest sign. If something indicates our salvation the most, it is healing. Healing means to be complete, to be restored. Healing means for somebody to go back to his original place. Healing talks about wholeness. The Hebrew will call it shalom, completeness. So healing is the most predominant miracle in the life of Jesus. Look at the four Gospels. It's the most predominant miracle because it's the closest sign of the Gospel. It speaks about reconciliation because our restoration to God is called healing. First Peter 2.24. Jesus mentioned, you know, we saw that earlier on where Jesus said that lest they believe and they are converted and they are healed. Hebrews 13, I mean, uh, Matthew 13, verse uh, 12, 13, and 14. You could check that later. Now, look at Luke 5. Luke 5. So every time Jesus talks about the healing of God, every time he talks about salvation, every time he talks about that restoration in the kingdom of God, healing was the most prominent miracle. Why? Because that is the closest sign to what he's saying. In Luke 5, in verse 17, he says, while he was in the synagogue, the power of the Lord was present to heal. Then they brought in a man through the roof. And then as he saw the man's faith in 20, notice, and you see, if you notice how Jesus speaks, or how he spoke and he still speaks. He said unto him, man, your sins are forgiven you. You wonder, oh, oh, sins are forgiven. This, this guy is, is on a crowd, is, a, is, a, is, is, is on a, a stretcher. And you say, your sins are forgiven you. And so everybody's, everybody went mad. Who is the one that has the power to forgive sins? Then it's all in their heart. He said, which one is easier? Verse 23, to see. Your sins are forgiven you, or say, rise up and walk. Then he says this, that you may know. Are you there? That the Son of Man hath power upon the earth to forgive sins. I say unto you, rise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Can you see what I'm saying here? So this is the sign of forgiveness. And because that was his message, that was a prominent sign of his ministry. A ministry that teaches the redemptive sacrifice of Christ has to be a healing ministry. Because there is no closest sign of what we see like the physical healing of people's bodies. Let me see if you understand that now. So healing is a pointer to the healing itself. It's a pointer to it. And so when the gospel is preached... Have you observed something? Look up now. Let me give you some study. That you hardly will find any sermon of Jesus on healing. You can only find examples. Why then did he heal the sick so much and we don't find any four chapters on healing? Why? Because that's the sign of what he's saying. Hallelujah. That means his message was healing. But the healing that is in his message is reconciliation with God, the kingdom of God. And the sign of that will be what? Physical and bodily healing. Let me see if you understand that quickly. Praise the Lord. So, we need not, we just preaching Christ's love for humanity to save them from sins. The power to heal the sick is available. Because that's the sign of it. Hallelujah. That's the sign of it. I want to God that many of our charismatics understood this. A dead man of God mentioned this. He said, he said, 
Charismatics can confirm. I'm a charismatic, very, very confirmed one. He said they can, they, they can convince an atheist to believe in God with signs and wonders. He said, but you don't know what they're going to say next. I said, that's interesting. How they don't even know the signs? What they're for? The signs will point to the message. Now, which means that just at the hearing of the gospel of God in Christ, the healing power is available. Because the healing of God is the sign of the healing of God. Do you understand that? Hallelujah. That's the sign of his forgiveness. That's a sign. That's what points to his forgiveness. Healing of our physical bodies. Glory to God. So you can't preach God forgives sins and God doesn't heal the sick. It's contradictory. Hallelujah. Where there's a message of God's forgiveness, except you are not sensitive, the healing power is present. That's the sign of what you just spoke about. Bodies are healed. Deaf ears are unstopped. Blind eyes are opened. Pains disappear. Why? Because man's greatest burden has been taken away by Jesus. That becomes the sign of that. So physical healing is an undeniable, eternal sign, as it were, of the gospel that we preach. So if Christ says he's in his church, in his own ecclesia, and we celebrate every day the forgiveness of sins, we celebrate this reconciliation. That means we have the power of God always to cure sickness and disease. Hallelujah. Are you still there? Are you still there? So for us as believers, healing is not something we should get scared about. It's something we should receive. And it doesn't matter how many times your body malfunctions. You can receive healing all the time. Doesn't matter how many times. And, and that's why I believe some, some have not taught this well. They've taught believers to think that when you're born again, then your body is totally healed. And no, 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 no. The body is a mortal body. It lives in the earth. But it can enjoy healing all the time. God's healing power is available in his church. Is available to the saints. Praise the Lord. All the time. Look at the book of Acts. Healing was present in Acts 2, Acts 3 and 4, Acts 5. And they made no distinction. Both believers and non-believers. In fact, in Acts 9, in Acts 9, where Peter went among the saints, he saw a brother, Aeneas. Aeneas is a brother. He's in a department in church. He says, Jesus Christ makes you whole. Hallelujah. The brother is crippled. He says, Jesus Christ, Acts 9.35, I believe. Jesus Christ makes you whole. Hallelujah. So it's not that when you are born again, then you say, ah, since I'm already healed, I'm reconciled, I'm forgiven. I don't need physical healing. That doesn't make any kind of sense. Your body, hallelujah, needs to be well. Your body needs to function well. Paul spoke about a prophetess. He said he was sick near to They said, God had mercy. Lest I have sorrow upon sorrow. Sickness is not joyful. It can't be joyful. Sickness can't be joyful. It is healing that is joyful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God doesn't glory in such sorrow. Praise God. Years ago, about 94, I was having a healing service, and this woman came up, she, she was speaking in Yoruba, and she said, you know, she believes that this growth, this cancer on her body is to make her humble. I said, okay. It was in Yoruba. I said, close your eyes, lift your two hands. I said, I thank you, Father. She said, I thank you, Father, for this cancer, for this cancer. She was just saying, oh, Lord, I ask you to give me more cancer to make me more humble. She said, ah! I said, but you want to be, don't you want to be humble? How can you say that? How can you say that? 
Hallelujah. It doesn't come from God. God did not remove what God put there. <laughs> that is Jekyll and Hyde. Okay, you know, do you know what that is? <laughs> that that is, is the evil and good one. No. He healed all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Hallelujah. So which one is easier? I've been asking that question for a while. Your sins are forgiven or take off your bed now. Which one is easier? The sign of the message. <laughs> I'll let you think about it. Hallelujah. But whichever way the power of the Lord is present here tonight. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, in Luke 5, the challenge was the service was filled with Pharisees and Sadducees. They were there to record his errors. I'm sure they were sick. You know, Jesus had a way of communicating with them. One day he was talking to them. He said, ah, ah. He said, I've not come to call the righteous. He was talking to them. The righteous. But the sinners. He said, those that are whole need no physicians. Those guys were just getting mad. This guy is nowhere, though. <laughs> it was sarcasm. <laughs> Hallelujah. So they also brought a lot of hatred to his meetings. He said, we'll get him today. So imagine you have a healing service. Everybody there, they came to doubt. <laughs> Everybody there came to doubt. And so the folks that got healed had to come in through the roofs. That if you are too tech, you may not have a healing service. If your roof is too covered. They had a coming through the roof. Now imagine if those guys didn't come in. They would have said, oh, well, no power. No power. How did they not know the power of the Lord was present? Because they were in dishonor. Dishonor would never recognize the power of God. Never. They were in unbelief. They were in unbelief. You know, we, we, we see that. You learning something here? Need to move quickly. They were in unbelief. Yet the power of the Lord was there. Which means the power of the Lord is tangible. Tangible. Because healing is not a feeling in the spirit. Okay? Healing happens in the body. So the gifts of healings and the power of God to heal the sick will be felt. It's in the, it's in the physical demonstrations. It's in the physical demonstration. In Mark 5, the woman touched him. And Jesus perceived that virtue had left his body. Because healing is tangible. It's tangible. That's why when you're in a healing service, there are some songs you will sing in a healing service, you wouldn't sing in a teaching service. Hallelujah. In a healing service, you know, you sing this song by Sinatra. Uh, Is there moving in this place? I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker. No, 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 no. So it's not a waymaker. He has made the way me, Oga. <laughs> that pain needs a way. Hallelujah. Do you understand? We make a miracle walker, promise keeper. That is because healing is tangible. It's not, a, it's not a sensation in your spirit. That's why all trans gifts and revelation gifts are called of the spirit. Healing is called power. Oshé? <laughs> Oshé? <laughs> it's power. Do you get it? It's not, I sense, there's no sense. I touched. That healing. So, we can sing a song like, What a healing Jesus I've found in you. What a healing Jesus to restore, refresh, and renew. I rise on him. No, say, he is inside of me. Oga. Oga. Oga, 
Let him arise. Oh. <laughs> Son of righteousness. Hallelujah. Just that because it's tangible. It's in the flesh. The power gifts are in the flesh. It's not, that is why, pay attention, in the meetings of the church, the prominent things are the utterance, then the revelation gifts, then the power gifts. But when we go to the world, the prominent thing is the power gift, then the revelation gift, and the utterance gifts. Hallelujah. Do you understand that? Because the men in the world are men in the senses. So they will see in the senses what you are saying in the spirit. You understand? So, you have to get their senses to attention. You don't say, you don't say, <laughs> That is in a teaching meeting. Hallelujah. By the healing service. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sit down. <laughs> In a healing service. Is power. And the word is dunamis. There must be an explosion. Because the sickness is in the flesh. Something must hit it. Agbara to agbara lo. There is more than this power. <laughs> Cancer is not cured by utterance. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Also, is not cured by revelation gifts. It's power. So, that means when it comes to the healing gifts, you must be sensitive to the natural. What is in the atmosphere? It's not that you are in the flesh. No, but you are looking at what is in the atmosphere. That is why in most cases, something is done, something is touched, something is said. Because since it's power, it must be contacted by touch. The touch can be words. The touch can be a physical touch. It can be material things. That's why Moses can lift up a rod. People are healed. Yet the message is not an object. But the healing has to be touched, has to be seen, has to be felt. Why? Because it is tangible power. And with power went about doing good. Acts 10 38. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So the gifts of healings, they work with material things. They work in the material world. That is why a good number of people will minister. Sometimes they'll pray in the cloths. They'll pray into water. They'll pray because that is how it works. It's in the natural. All the power gifts, they deal with nature. They either suspend it or restore something that has been done wrong in nature. That is the power gifts. Don't, don't confuse it. It is felt. And so, when you sense power, sometimes you can sense it in your spirit. Okay? When you sense power, release words immediately. Don't imagine. In Mark 5, for she said. I remember one service, I say this often. I was ministering, and I told myself I wasn't going to pray for the sick. And I'm, and I'm praying, and I'm teaching, so I was just talking about the power of God is here. And someone had... A, a part of our body that wasn't working. And I just put my hands on her and said, you know, the power of God is there. I was just saying it casually. But because she said he would lay hands on me and I'll be healed. I wasn't praying for the sick. And she got healed. Why? 
Because it is the assembly of the healer, he's there. So she gave direction to the power. Jesus was going to the house of Jairus. He wasn't planning a healing meeting. In fact, the disciples said, Be, okay, move, move, move. Just like Michael and and all these uh, and Pastor Lan and their CSO people. Move, move. No, 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 no. Jesus said, okay, okay, just do like this. Okay. <laughs> he was trying to move. He was trying to move. You know, he was doing like this. He said, okay, okay. Master, yeah, go like this. Go like this. Okay, this way. Then the woman was looking like this. That's all. Immediately. The fount of our blood ceased. I said, ah. Jesus said, okay, let me What's going on? He said, Master, what's going on? Can't you see crowd? Mm-mm. Wait. Something has come out. He felt the power had gone out. So, there has to be an action for that power. Take up your bed and walk. Rise up. Behold. Instructions of something you must do in the natural. Stretch your leg. Now start to run. You must take an action in the natural because the power is where? In the natural. Go check yourself. Sometimes, have you observed? Sometimes you still be feeling a bit when I say, do what you couldn't do before. Is that that point? Why? Because that is how to contact it. Power. You act on it in the natural. Hallelujah. So, dishonor does not recognize it, it doesn't. Play for us now. We're done with that. This honor doesn't recognize it. When you see a brother or sister as a mere friend and they carry the healing power of God, you can't get healed. No, all the I owe my in the Greek. Now, so you go, no, I'm. There's someone from somewhere who doesn't even know the person. Just say, hey, they do miracle. They do miracle. In get out. In get out. <laughs> That's all. Imagine if we all honored ourselves. James says, is there any sick? Why would Paul say, this is why some are sick? That means sickness is not something we celebrate. Say any sick among you. Let him call for the elders. He didn't say any sick among you. Eh, eh, tell him sorry. Let him call for the elders. He said, let them pray for him. Anoint him with the of the Lord. He said, the prayer of, the, of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord, James is definite, he will raise him up. But he has to call. That call is honor. He has to call. Pastor Oscar, pray for me. Pastor Ken, pray for me. Hallelujah. How do you... In fact, sometimes it's important how you call pastors. Don't call your pastor by nickname. It's dishonor. That's why some people close to you. I taught a series in church, you could go get it. The practice of the spirit. How to minister to your family members. And how your family members can receive from you. You have to know when to differentiate husband and wife, friend and cousin. No. When he is standing in that office, he's not your brother. He's not your cousin. He's a minister of the gospel. That's why others who receive from the same person, and you will not. Because it is what you see that you get. See the street and sidewalks. And suddenly, you see him. As a man walk through the entrance of the city, heal the sick, he raised the dead, and he set the captives free. Sit down. 
and with trembling lips you could hear the people say his name is Jesus Jesus he is the son of God Jesus Jesus the precious son of God he's reigning Lord of glory who died to set me free Jesus Jesus you are everything to me you mean all the world to me what a he I found it. what a healing in Jesus to restore and renew what a healing in Jesus at such a time as this I rise and heal and I believe in miracles I see a soul set free. The miraculous, a changing one, revealed through color. I see a Jesus! Yeah. 